welcome everybody to today's panel. Uh, if you're new to BID, welcome to the family. We are a small charity that provides free legal advice to people facing detention and deportation. We've become increasingly concerned about the UK's automatic deportation regime and the effect that it is having in tearing lives apart. In the words of Stephen Shaw, former prisons and probation ombudsman, I found during my visits across the immigration estate that a significant proportion of those deemed foreign national offenders had grown up in the UK, some having been born here, but the majority having arrived in early childhood. These detainees often had strong UK accents, had been to UK schools, and all of their close family and friends were based in the UK. So we wanted to do this event today to create a space to discuss and raise awareness about this issue. And we're very grateful that we have the panelists that we do and that so many of you have decided to attend. We're gonna start the event with a screening of Motherland, which was created as part of this year's Uncertain Kingdom series and was directed by Ellen Evans and produced by Alice Hughes. It traces the experience of two young men, Tremaine and A.T., who will forcibly return to Jamaica after a lifetime in Britain, alongside the story of Ken, a winter generation man, denied re-entry to the UK. I'm afraid the screening won't be included in the recording if you're watching this on demand. So if you are watching on demand, we'll skip now straight into the panel discussion. Uh, we want to say a special thank you to Katie, Tremaine and Ken for sharing their stories and to Ellen and Alice and the Uncertain Kingdom for creating this film and allowing us to show it today. It was really important for us to ground this discussion in how these policies are affecting people. So we're very glad to be able to show this film. We have a fantastic panel here who I am sure have plenty to say. So I'll give a very brief introduction and then we'll head straight into the questions. If we have time, we'll also take questions from the audience at the end. So if you are watching and want to ask a question, there's a Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen, uh, which you can use to submit your questions. So joining us today, we have Kwaku Adaboli, public speaker and culture and systems advisor, who was deported from the UK to Ghana in 2018. Nadine Elanani, who teaches at Burbeck School of Law, and is co-director at the Centre for Research on Race and Law, and is also author of Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire. We have Dr Zabeda Hack, who has written a lot on this topic and is interim director of race equality think tank, The Running Lead Trust. We have BID's own Carmen Kearney, who is legal manager of BID's uh, Article 8 Deportation Advice Project which provides free legal advice and representation to help people appealing their deportation. And finally, we have Luke Binarona, who is a academic and is author of a forthcoming book called Deporting Black Britons, Portraits of Deportation to Jamaica. So I'd like to say welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the first point that we wanted to explore was how did we get to where we are today? And how has the legacy of empire and colonialism shaped the UK's approach to immigration policy? Now, I know Nadine wrote a whole book on this topic, so we are going to ask her to comment on this first. Sure, thanks. Thanks for listening, everyone, to BID for organising this event and for inviting me. And it's um, great to see so many people um, attending the event. So, yeah, I think, I think for me, the first thing to um, understand about um, UK immigration law and policy is that it's not only shaped by British colonialism, but that it's actually an extension of colonialism itself. Um, so historically, as the British Empire was defeated, um, successive British governments introduced immigration controls, which took away the rights of racialized Commonwealth citizens and British colonial subjects to enter the British mainland. And um, Particularly, it did so using a, a legal concept, which is known as patriality, which was introduced in the 1971 Immigration Act. And this stipulated that only those born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain had a right of entry and stay. And so what it did is actually made whiteness intrinsic to British identity. So in 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. So the result of this piece of legislation 
was to prevent the vast majority of racialized colonial and former colonial subjects from being able to travel to and settle in Britain. Um, after this piece of legislation, the 1981 British Nationality Act continued this process of racial exclusion by constructing British citizenship on the basis of the 1971 Act's concept of patriality. So it also tied citizenship to the right of entry and abode. And what this did is that it raised for the first time this idea or created this place of a post-imperial territorially defined Britain. And it severed um, a notionally white geographically distinct Britain from the remainder of its colonies and Commonwealth. And this was a really important move, um, both materially and symbolically, because if you have a territorially distinct Britain and a concept of citizenship that's, um, that makes Britishness commensurate with whiteness, um, then it also suggests that the landmass and everything within Britain um, belongs exclusively to Britons, who of course are then understood um, to be white. So the 1981 Act didn't actually signify an end to British colonialism, even though the Home Secretary at the time said that the idea of the Act was to communicate to people who'd had a connection with Britain in terms of its empire, um, didn't necessarily have a right to be in Britain and didn't belong in Britain. Um, what it actually was, was a kind of a final um, seizure, a final colonial seizure, an act of an, an appropriation, um, um, kind of seizing that wealth and infrastructure secured by centuries of colonial conquest. Um, and so the kind of immediate effect of the 1981 Act, together with the changes to immigration law that I, that I just mentioned, was to put um, Britain as a place and the wealth in Britain um, gained by colonial conquest out of the reach of the vast majority of people um, who were both racialized through colonial processes and also um, dispossessed of, of, of um, they're, they're, they're often their lands, um, but also if we think about colonial um, possessions as being broader than kind of what's in the British Museum, but think about it in terms of futures, jobs, securities, um, the, you know, access to clean air, water, etc, you know, basic means of life. Um, and, but it also what it did, and I think this was hinted at, at in the film as well, and very powerfully by, by one of the um, um, people affected, um, um, by deportation is that it also led to a questioning of racialized people's entitlement to be present in Britain. And so what you get is a kind of um, street violence that's also then reinforced by institutionalized forms of racial violence. Um, so essentially what, 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 what happened after the, this legislation was passed in 71 and 81 is that a kind of um, domestic form of colonialism was implemented within Britain um, where we see um, kind of the basic means of life also disproportionately withheld from racialized people within Britain as they are also made subject to um, expulsion and removal um, uh, um, fr from Britain. And so, and then of course we're familiar with processes of internal bordering whereby um, the kind of police um, serve to reinforce um, these new white nationalist boundaries that were drawn in, in the 70s and the 80s. Um, and we see that, of course, in the way in which racialized communities are policed, um, um, kind of subject to kind of militarized form of policing, um, disproportionate stop and search, mass incarceration, arrest, etc. But also we see policies like the hostile environment policy, um, which we have to see as part of a long line of um, um, kind of um, racial state violence, um, introducing a kind of border in every street and um, where racialized people kind of experience these nation state borders, no matter their physical location. And of course, we know this led to thousands of people being detained, deported, denied access to housing, healthcare, education, financial services, with of course, fatal consequences in some cases. Um, so yeah, I think, I think I'll stop there. Hopefully that outlines um, the kind of way in which historical imperial um, legacies and um, you know intertwine today and, and allow us to kind of understand immigration law not as a set of kind of laws and policies that determine sort of who is deserving and who isn't but rather actually themselves are extensions of, of colonial power. Thank you Nadine that was really uh, thorough and insightful. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the panel wanted to chip in on this one if so do you go ahead? I kind of wanted to add the, the contemporary um, context where kind of the UK, whilst reducing the rights of former colonial subjects who were in the UK, was in the early 90s and certainly in 2000, 2001, 
still having this really open door immigration policy of attracting as many people as possible. And then for some reason in 2003, um, the rhetoric changed and we started to see a lot more narratives about um, Africans, West Africans, Sub-Saharan Africans crossing the Sahara Desert to get to the Mediterranean, to get across to Europe. Um, and then in 2006, and, and that led to the Labour government, um, David Blunkett, Alan Johnson, kind of putting in this really much more draconian immigration policies as an extension, as Nadine has just said, of, of a much longer process. But then in 2006, 2008, there was this huge furore around foreign national offenders who had been released, but nobody knew who were who they were, who were clearly terrorizing the streets of the UK and all needed to be rounded up and put under this policy of automatic deportation and everyone shunted out. Now, the great, I mean, not the great thing, but the 2006, seven policy, the 2007 act, which had these, which brought in automatic deportation had protections in it um, based on human rights, on the Human Rights Act. And so in 2011, 2012, um, when Theresa May started her hostile environment, one of the key things she targeted was the protections that foreign national offenders were um, subject to. And which is part of the reason why the policy has become increasingly draconian is that all of the factors that someone can rely on, all the human factors that someone can rely on to protect themselves are being systematically removed. And, um, and that is why the, the policy has become so inhumane and so damaging. Thank you very much, thank you. Um, I'm going to move up onto the next question because um, we're going to run out of time on that one. Um, so the second point that we wanted to talk about was uh, the UK deport any non-British citizen with a criminal conviction of 12 months or more, regardless of how long they've lived here. What do you think about this regime and how the government justifies it? Um, we thought we might go to Carmen maybe first on this one uh, to talk about kind of Sid's experience with our aid yeah. Right. yeah, well, this relates to the 2007 Borders Act, which brought in the system of automatic deportation. Um, and what that says is that the, uh, it's in the public interest to deport foreign national offenders. Um, and those sentenced to 12 months or more must be deported, um, unless you can show it be some a breach of human rights or the Refugee Convention. Um, and the government's position is that is this regime is compliant with human rights law. So to challenge deportation based on length of residence or family life, which, which is known as Article 8 um, grounds, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, um, you have to show that certain exceptions apply. But as you've just heard, um, uh, this is, it, 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 it's, in many ways, it is not, it's, it's quite dehumanised how this works because there are very big uh, problems with the exceptions. Um, they're very narrowly defined and they're very, very high thresholds. They're really hard to meet. Um, but also the exceptions only apply to you um, if you were sentenced to less than four years. So four years or more sentence, you have to have even a higher test, which is called the very compelling circumstances test. But I'll talk a little bit about the exception, just so you have an idea of what the kind of test is to meet. So somebody who has um, uh, been in the UK, say came as a child, been for a very long time, they're um, challenged deportation based on their family life, uh, sorry, their private life, length of residence. Um, and you think that just having been here for a long time is going to be uh, a very significant factor, but actually what you have to show um, is three things, three limbs to the test. You have to show you've been lawfully resident for at least half your life and you're socially and culturally integrated and there'd be very significant obstacles to integration to the country to which you're facing deportations. So all three limbs have to be met. Um, but there are, there are clear difficulties with this test. Uh, with the lawful residence test, um, we have many people that, that, that came as children. They've had periods when they've been here, but they've not been lawfully resident. Uh, it could be for many reasons. It may have been that the parents um, didn't, didn't ex apply to extend leave if they had leave initially. They may have been in care and, and an application for leave wasn't, um, wasn't made. There could be a whole range of reasons beyond the control of, of the child. But because of that, you have periods where you will, will fall down on the first limb of the test. The second thing, uh, social and cultural integration, uh, you would think that somebody who was um, brought up here, who went to school here, um, has family here, maybe even was born here, was socially and culturally integrated. 
Uh, but in fact, uh, the Home Office position is, is, is often that, well, the very fact you've uh, been in prison and excluded from prison and being excluded from society for your prison time, and the fact you've offended uh, means you're not socially and culturally integrated because you've rejected British values. And clearly, we don't say that if people who, uh, who British citizens who go to prison and offend, we don't say, well, you, you, you know, you, you don't, you're not integrated because you reject British values. Um, so, you know, you, you fall down the second one. And the third one of uh, various significant obstacles, obstacles to um, integration in the country of origin, um, or the country going to be deported to if you never, if you were born here. Um, just to give us examples of what Home Office is guidance says do not amount to various different obstacles. Um, not speaking the language. Well, they would say, well, you can learn the language. You don't have to be fluent. You can pick it up when you're there, unless there's some mental disability, which means you can't do it. Um, if you've never lived in the country to which you're facing deportation, they'd say, well, um, you know, you can adapt culturally. Um, and they often assume, well, you know, you must have had some contact with the culture when you're growing up through the parents or you know, some familiarity, so you'll be fine. Uh, but often people haven't. They've, they've, you know, they, they, they may have eaten some traditional food at home, for instance, but basically they've born and brought up here, go to school here, have British culture. And they're, they're, they're totally, the culture of where they're being returned to is completely unfamiliar. We heard this, and it came across very clearly in, in the film we just watched. Um, is that it's often people are being removed to a completely alien place, which is alien to them, um, uprooted from everything. Um, but you know, it is a, a very, very significant obstacle to to integration if you don't speak the language, have no support network, totally unfamiliar with with um, where you're being sent to. Um, but you know, that's 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 not seen as a problem by the Home Office. So um, you know, it, it's basically the test is really hard to meet. You can be uprooted from everything you know. Um, having lived here, you know, been brought up here and lived here, um, and the consequence can be devastating. But the Home Office say this is compliant with human rights. So, you know, there's some very problems with, with that. It's just dehumanised. Mm. Thanks, Carmen. Um, did anybody else want to add anything um, on that topic? Uh, Zubeda? Um, I, I think I completely want to echo what Carmen said, and indeed what, what Nadine and, and Kweku have said, which is, we've got an extraordinary system where not only is there a historical legacy of chipping away of the citizenship rights of black and ethnic minority people, but arguably under Labour after 2000, and then subsequently under the Conservative government from 2010, it has got a lot worse because what we have now is a system where we have the systematic, where we've got a culmination, if you like, of the systematic chipping away of rights of black and ethnic minority citizens, the obscuring of citizenship with criminality, and in particular, trying to make out that someone is a foreign national offender regardless of whether that definition, the definition is true only in theory, but regardless of whether that person was raised here, has been here for most of their life, has been raised here, has family and friends here, regardless of whether their entire life has been spent here. And on top of that, what we have is citizenship rights that are no longer secure in the sense that until quite recently, we could argue that it was an entirely racialized two-tier system, citizenship system, and that it distinguished between black and ethnic minority citizens versus white British citizens. But what Shamima Begum's case showed was that actually, even being born in this country, even being born in this country, spending your entire life here, never having been to the country of your parents, in her case, Bangladesh, is not protection. There is no protection if the government think that you have committed acts that are unacceptable against the public good or not meeting good character requirements. And 
Shamima becomes city, Shamima, Shamima becomes case is I think particularly stark because she lost her first stage of appeal against the government over the decision to remove her UK citizenship. Now, put aside your feelings about whether she is a terrorist or not, that is a different debate. The issue is the Special Immigration Appeals Commission rejected that Shamima Bagum would be made stateless. Now, if you're made stateless, the government can't strip you of your citizenship rights. So the, it was argued for a long time that the Home Office could not strip Shamima Begum of her citizenship rights because she was made stateless. She would be made stateless. The Special Immigration Appeals Commission rejected that because they said she was a citizen of Bangladesh by descent. Now that has huge ramifications for anyone, regardless of whether they are black and ethnic minority, but anyone who has any foreign links through their parents. In other words, you are only secure if you are white British, because if you have any foreign links at all through your parents, if you are foreign by descent, that means the government can now deport you or strip you of your citizenship rights. And that's where we're at right now, where we not only have a very racialized two-tier citizenship system, but it distinguishes you from being white British or not being white British. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I'm going to move us on to the next question. Um, I'm hearing that apparently the sound isn't clear at times. So I'm going to put the question into the chat just in case anyone's not able to uh, understand me when I do the question. Um, we're going to move on to the next one. So we wanted really to talk a bit about what it's actually like for people experiencing this. Um, so I think we'll come to Kwaku on this one because I know you were keen to talk a bit about your experiences. So what is it like for people going through the violence and trauma of deportation away from everything that they know? Um, it, uh, it's really difficult to answer this question. I think the short answer is um, the immigration process, the fight against the Home Office, the deportation process are all deeply traumatic. It's equivalent to physical violence, right? So in, um, I, was, uh, I was convicted of fraud by abusive position as a result of my bank losing um, uh, 1.4 billion pounds on my desk. Um, no one was harmed, the bank lost money. Um, and I was found not guilty of acting in my own interest. I was found guilty of acting in the bank's interest. So that's the context. I was sentenced to seven years in prison. So automatically my sentence was longer than four years, which meant that um, I was liable to automatic deportation. And all of the protections that we talk about were not available to me. So even though I'd lived for more than half my life in the UK, even though uh, my private life was deeply extended, even though I could prove that I was um, deeply integrated, even uh, just four days before I was detained for the first time, I'd just come back from a three-day session with the SAS um, and General Officer Peter Wall and Tony Blair and others teaching the SAS how to deal with risk and failure. Um, so there was no question over whether I was contributing. There was no question over um, whether I was a, a risk or danger to society. Um, there was no question over whether I, I showed remorse. There was no question over whether I was rehabilitated. There was no question. Um, and yet it was deemed that I was a threat to the nation and that I should be deported. Um, and the fight itself against deportation took um, from 2012 until 2018, so six years, over which time the government said to me that I, first they told me I wasn't allowed to work and had to take them to court to prove that I was allowed to work just so I could earn some money. Um, just so I could prove that I was trying to contribute to the society. Uh, to cut a long story short, um, right at the end of the process, um, obviously a lot of people got involved in trying to figure out a way to reverse my, my, my deportation, which involved pulling in over 140 MPs, um, various uh, public figures, 75,000 people signed a petition. It's very hard to imagine that there could have been more public support for someone not to be deported, right? And yet the government 
send me a letter, Sajid Javid sent me a letter saying that we have to deport you because you've abused your hospitality in the United Kingdom. Um, and the first and initial emotion when you, you get when you see that is a sense of betrayal. And it's like, well, if I abuse my hospitality, that means I must have been a guest. At what, at what point does someone who is sent to the UK stop being a guest? So if I came to the UK at the age of 12, how long do I have to be in the UK to not be a guest anymore? Or if I was born in the UK, but my, pa my parents didn't sort out my paperwork, how can I be a guest in the UK? So this idea that I abused the hospitality of the United Kingdom was particularly galling because it felt like a betrayal, considering that I'd been out of prison for the best part of three and a half years, and I was doing all I could to contribute to the community. Now, to make it even worse, what was really galling was the way in which the deportation was exercised. So initially, the government had intended to put me on a charter flight going to Nigeria and Ghana, um, you know, typically with 50 other offenders, ex-offenders, um, shackled to our seats with three guards per, uh, per deportee. Um, and remember, not all those people on that plane would have been um, ex-offenders. So um, we, we fought really hard. We got an adjournment. Um, we got a, uh, an injunction against my removal. And so at that point, um, as you'll know from bid, you know, immediately, okay, we're, we're still in a legal process, so we should get bail now. We went to the tribunal and asked for immigration bail after we got the injunction. And despite having a spotless immigration record for the best part of four years, during the period where I was checking in every week to immigra immigration, um, I was told that I, I wasn't allowed to have bail because I would abscond. Even though I'd been going through this process and obviously I hadn't absconded, otherwise they would have got me back in detention. Um, so we fought against that, we went to the MPs and eventually they released me from detention. Then we went back to court for a uh, permission hearing for judicial review. We went up against the deputy president of the tribunal. And normally a judicial review takes about an hour, a ju judicial review permission hearing takes about an hour, um, maybe half a day. In our case, it took a day and a half and Judge Ockleton spent a day and a half absolutely systematically ripping apart every pillar of my reasons why I shouldn't be deported from the UK and finished at the end saying that I was so dishonest, that I was dishonest about my dishonesty and that my MP, my, my, my ex-partner and my friends and family had all basically been deceived and were lying on my behalf. So if you can imagine sitting in a courtroom and this figure of state is telling you that you are literally the least useful human being in the world and you must be deported um, to away from the UK because you're such a, a threat to the country in contradiction of all the work he'd be doing. So all through this process, there's this increasing sense of betrayal and being discarded because you're no longer useful. The final act um, was how they put me on the plane. So what happens is they come to get you at like one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so obviously, eventually they once the, Judge Ockleton had made his decree that I must be deported immediately, they put me back in detention. And that was on a Monday. And then on the Wednesday morning, the security guys came to get me. And, you know, they processed me. We sat down in the van. I'm in a van with eight security people. And the guy to my left says to me, you know, you know, this is a really difficult process. And, you know, we don't agree with it. We're just doing a job. Um, we're here for you. If there's anything you want to talk about, you know, I understand this is emotionally difficult. We are, we, are, we are just like you, so feel free to, to confide in us your emotional struggles right now. I didn't say a great deal, but what they did was they drove me onto the airside on the tarmac at Heathrow. And they parked the, the van next to um, a Royal Air Maroc flight and then gave me my mobile phone and said, you can now call your friends and family. So of course I called my friends and family and everyone's like, where are you? What flight are you getting? And I'm like, well, we're I was sat next to Royal Air Maroc, probably going to be Royal Air Maroc. And then once um, my friends and family had figured out that we were on the Royal Air Maroc flight, as they thought, they then took the phone off me and then drove me back to this Kenya Airways flight, carried me up the back of the stairs and sat me down at the back of this flight. So now it's like, okay, so there's this process of betrayal and discarding. And then right at the end, there's this like sense of total manipulation where what they'd done was they basically, 
the sleight of hand was designed to stop the media and the press finding out which flight I was on so the flight couldn't be disrupted. But the problem is I was now sat at the back of the plane in the middle of this row with five guards stood up around me as I became increasingly agitated because nobody knew where I was. I started to hyperventilate and it was the hyperventilation and the, my increasing demands to be allowed to call my friends and family that caused them all to stand up. And so the result of this is this, you just feel like this very small, meaningless purpose. And I sat there for four hours and just literally just sobbed. And 26 years of my life in the UK replayed. And it wasn't until about four hours into the flight when um, luckily Chris Law's MP, um, SNP MP was on the flight and he came to the back of the plane, asked the security if he could talk to me stood me up in the galley at the back and we talked for three hours and eventually I, I calmed down. Now, that's just the actual deportation. Since I've been in Ghana, despite like the incredible embrace of the entire country, my family, um, you know, every level of society is like, welcome home. Don't be sad about being here. We want you here. We think you can contribute to our community. So in that sense, it was very positive to be in Ghana, especially to get away from the negative influence of the Home Office. However, it then took a year, at least, of weekly therapy sessions, sitting in my room at my dad's house in utter depression, um, never leaving the house, unable to interact with people, suddenly realizing that the only way to survive being deported was to discard my relationships with the UK, right? I had to distance myself from the UK in order to be able to establish myself in Ghana. And that has been the most difficult thing I've ever had to do in my life because all these people who are my friends and family who I dearly love, in order to survive here, I have to reduce my contact with them. And that has been one of the most difficult things because the effect of it is a sense of a violent act, like your body's reacting to it in a violent way. And I now have a condition called adrenal fatigue, where if I get stressed or if I do too much exercise or if I don't sleep enough, my body just swells up. And I retain tons of water and my weight can fluctuate between, you know, by about 10, by 10 kilos over a couple of days. And the effect of it is extreme fatigue, which obviously stops me being able to work and being able to take on new challenges, et cetera. So the, the real effect of deportation is, is, is a rather violent thing. And that's just, you know, and I've got all the resources in the world with masses of support from family and friends, in fact, an entire country. There have been times in the last 18 months where I've just sat there going, I don't really understand how anyone can survive being ripped away from their society in this way, um, because the, the, the cost of rebuilding is so high and the damage that it's done is so violent. Thanks so much for sharing that. Really, really appreciate you you doing that. Um, Luke, we wanted to come to you because um, you've done lots of work with people uh, deported uh, from the UK who, whose lives were, were, were here. Um, would you like to add anything to, to that on this yeah. question? Yeah, I can try to. I mean, it's, it's hard after hearing that to speak in the kind of second or third person about people because there's so many different experiences and Greg is describing one experience of the violence at different stages. I suppose what I would say is um, from the many people I met who were deported to Jamaica, that's where I've met people. Um, there are different experiences, but I suppose the, the some of the things you described there, Quaker, are, are quite unusual in that um, being incarcerated for a white collar crime is very rare. Um, so a lot of these guys are, are, are kind of struggling to make arguments even to themselves and their loved ones about contribution and integration. Um, which I think does mean that there's a kind of invisibility to a lot of people's experiences of being detained, uh, receiving letters with probably lower levels of liter legal literacy than you had, Kwaku, so struggling to understand what it is, very, very low levels of rep legal representation. So, I mean, you described Carmen's post there, but part of that is about responding to legal aid being decimated for Article 8 cases and for deport cases. So a lot of people I met had never seen a judge even though they'd had if you read the home office decisions they're terrible and they say lots of the kinds of things that Carmen describes in terms of 
you may have lived here since you were two, but you've not integrated because you have a criminal record. Or they say, is your relationship with this person really genuine and subsisting? Or did, because you started that relationship when you had, had no status, so it can't be seen as genuine and subsisting. So these kind of things, um, these kind of things come, come in at people while they're often incarcerated, receiving decision letters from the Home Office, trying to appeal on their own or not, missing deadlines. Um, and so, for example, one of the guys in my project, Nico, burnt his documents when he came back to Jamaica. And I think there's a symbolism in that, which captured a lot of what a lot of people felt, which was just like, I've had this wad of documents and what, what was any of it for? Um, so I think that experience really resonates with Quakers, but it's also probably more normal that people are incarcerated for crimes of poverty, that their literacy is lower, that their connection to legal advice is smaller, that there is no campaign, basically. Um, and in terms of what that then does to people when they are returned and how it devastates their lives, the things that Quakers described do it much better than I can because but I think they're familiar in the sense that there's both the horrendousness of the flight but then there's the return and how one deals with what is the most unimaginable form of punishment that I can imagine to be separated from children, partners, friends, memories and to end up in Jamaica with estranged family members or even with loved ones or in a homeless shelter um, which a lot of people do end up in that kind of situation or with a friend of a friend um, not knowing anyone at the airport is going to be there these kinds of things are pretty regular um, but I would want to emphasize too that that when we're doing advocacy work we tend to talk about deportation as the end so there's the the stories of people on the streets of Kingston and they're the things that you write about for the advocacy piece or for the piece to try and make a difference to policy. But people, people build and move and I think it's important to give people that um, and recognise that kind of agency, which means that when the flight lands, that's not the end of life. For some people, don't make it and it is. It does become the end of their life within a short period of time and we saw that in Jamaica with the reporting on people who've been killed within one year, five or six who were known. Um, but most people find ways to live and um, and so I wouldn't want to kind of paint this grisly picture for the sake of simplifying what are many individual stories of flux and change and tragedy and strength of various kinds. So I can't be more specific than that on the damage wrought, but it is Quaker's description will will do more than more than anyone can else can say really. Thanks, Luke. Um, Carmen, did you want to add anything in terms of BID's experience um, or the experience of BID's clients? Yeah, well, it, it, it's hard to add to, to what Quaker and Luke already said. I mean, they've already explained and said it's 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 just incredibly traumatic. It's really hard to to underestimate how scared people are uh, if you're if you're uprooted from everything you know, everything you're familiar with, and it's really it's a form of exile, really, because uh, you know, it's a double punishment. You're you've done your time. Um, and then you're uprooted and sent away from anything you know. It's it's um, I think the other thing to be aware of is is often it's it's um, it, it's really can be permanent. It, it's it, once once the deportation order is enforced, you you can't come back into the UK lawfully. You have to apply for that order to be cancelled or revoked. Um, it doesn't just fall away. Um, and the Home Office position is that um, really certain periods of time should have passed before you should be allowed to even before it's considered appropriate to even think about revoking and cancelling the order. Uh, and for people who've been said to years or more, the Home Office position is it should be permanent. Um, so you know, it's, it's really hard to, um, to, to capture how traumatic it, it is for people to be separated from everything they know, their family, their friends, everything, and to go somewhere where they're not familiar with, and that separation could be permanent. Um, I mean, the, the, we've heard, you know, the, the council, but it's, it's really hard to estimate that um, it is a form of exile. It's, it's, this, this stress is just um, on the person and their families is just enormous. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I think also it's worth uh, talking about the effects beyond the individual, um, as we know that this affects children left behind, families left behind, entire communities, um, and really the whole of our society. Um, so if we do look at broadening that out, what is it like for those left behind in the UK and how does deportation affect children, families and communities left behind? 
Quaker, do you want to take the lead on this one again? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't know if everyone knows, but during when when you're going through the deportation, and you're re reporting into home the Home Office, and you're on bail, you have to basically live with someone. You, you can't be on your own. So I lived with my two best friends and and my two godsons, and one of my godsons was born after I got I started living with them, and so. I, I became like a third parent to them. And what's really interesting is to see the damage that it did, like the deportation did not just to me, but to everyone around us. So what um, normally happens is that the home office and the courts focus on the individual going through the process as if they are an individual and the people around them um, don't have rights as to whether or not that individual should be removed from their community. And of course, what's happening is that whilst my two godsons have their own parents, the damage that was done to them by my deportation was still huge. Uh, you know, a four-year-old and a six-year-old don't understand why an adult that they live with and they trust and, and, and they love is being taken away. And the effects of that obviously um, manifest for a long period after the deportation. I'm really lucky. I come from uh, um, I, I, I have the resources, my friends have the resources to be able to travel. They travel to come and see me. I've seen the boys twice in the 18 months since I was deported. But there's still this really difficult situation of when's Kwaku coming back? And, and it's like, well, you know, well, we'll go visit Kwaku because he's spending time with his mom and dad. Um, and I think that's really tough on children. And the system just doesn't have a mechanism to factor for children and others who are affected by deportation. And it's so much the case that even if they were my children, I would have to prove that it was excessively cruel. That's the legal standard, that it's excessively cruel to remove me from my children to avoid being deported. Now, the reality is being removed from your children is excessively cruel. Like it, there's no, like if there's one lesson I've learned in the last 18 months, if you take an adult away from their community, it's massively damaging, let alone taking an adult from their own children. And so this language of the standard is excessively cruel is insane. I don't know how as a society we've got to the point where we've allowed legal language and government language policy to state that someone can only exercise their, their human right to associate with another human if it's, ex they, they can only be allowed to exercise it if it's excessively cruel to stop them from exercising it. I'm sitting here telling everyone, it's excessively cruel to remove people from their community, even adults, let alone children. And so this entire edifice of law is just utterly violent and unacceptable because you can't take an adult from their community, let alone all the children and all the old people who lived in the UK forever being taken away from their communities. It is just unconscionable that this is where we are. I'm seeing all the other panelists are nodding along. You're absolutely right. Um, and that certainly represents Bid's vision on all of this. Um, Carmen, would you like to uh, add to that? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, it basically, I mean, it just, it does tear uh, families apart. But um, Quaker was, was talking about um, excessively cruel. Um, where that comes in is, I talked earlier about the exceptions to um, deportation with the public interest. And one of those based on family life with a child, if you can show you've got a subsisting parental relationship with a child, qualifying child. Um, but even if you have, you have to show that it'd be, um, the, the, the legal terms are unduly harsh for the child to stay in the UK with the parent who's still here or to relocate with the person facing deportation um, and the home office definition of unduly harsh is excessively cruel as we've heard um, and uh, the home office definition of what there's no there's no actual definition of what excessively cruel is um, you know, how do you how do you define excessively cruel um, but if we look at home office guidance, it states that for someone to be unduly harsh, and I quote, there needs to be a degree of harshness beyond what would necessarily be involved for a child faced with the deportation of a parent. So we know it's going to cause stress and trauma to be deported, but that's not enough, it has to go beyond that. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hard to, to, to define that and to try and meet that test. What does that really mean? Um, and the kind of examples we've had will be... Um, 
we've, we've shown this has been where, for instance, the child has a particular health condition, maybe severe, severe autism, um, has difficulties expressing their emotions, um, uh, difficulties communicating, um, and the, the parent who's facing deportation is very, um, has a very, very close bond, is very, um, very important in their daily care. Um, uh, but even with that, we need to have expert evidence in the form of independent social work reports to actually document the impact on the child before we have any real chance of succeeding even in those kind of cases. Um, so, you know, it is, it is, um, you know, it, it, the, the, the legal, the legal language, legal test, it is hard to, to, um, to link that to the reality of what that means for a, a parent and child being separated. Um, I mean, just, I mean, uh, just you know, as an example as well, the Home Office will often say, well, look, we know it's going to be, you know, maybe a cause from stress, but you can keep in contact with a child through what they call remote means, so video calling, for instance. Um, but I mean, just to look at the current circumstances, we all know in, in lockdown, we've had, when we haven't been able to have contact with, with our, our loved ones personally, have personal contact, um, that Zoom is, is, is great, but it's not any substitute for, for personal contact. So, and that's with adults. So you compare that to a child trying to have a Zoom call with their, their, their parent who's, you know, thousands of miles away. It's just, it, it doesn't, it, it just has no um, bearing on the reality of what that means for the family. Um, it's just, uh, I mean, I've, we've got, you know, examples of, of cases where we have um, children, uh, parents of, um, I've got one person who um, has been here, came as a very young uh, adult. He's got three British citizen children, two with special educational needs. Um, uh, and he's, you know, core to the family, really important in terms of um, care of the children. Um, and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's fighting deportation. We're having to, you know, try and show that you know, the impact on the children would be excessively cruel um it's just uh, it's, it's just really hard to um to kind of um compute the legal language as um Craig was saying with, with the reality of, of the impact in people's lives thanks carmen um luke did you want to add anything from your kind of research yeah. in this area yeah i was just going to say i mean the kind of impacts on kids these horrendous impacts are totally routine so i I'm sure there's a few lawyers on the call who will have many stories about children of men, usually, who are detained and then deported, for example, beginning to play up in school or starting to wet the bed, and then that being evidence used that you gather. But I suppose I also want to think about how, when we're trying to necessarily turn these traumatic realities into a defence or into a case, we also aren't able to say certain kinds of things. So for example, I think Quakely's example is the thing that got me thinking about this. His relationship to those kids who he lived with is completely mm -hmm. illegible. There is basically no legal argument. You've got no chance if they've got two parents. And I found this a lot with guys in Jamaica was, for example, relationships between siblings and their, small, and their smaller siblings. So the person facing deportation were impossible to mention. Relationships between adult children and their parents were almost impossible unless there were exceptional circumstances. Proving evidence for any of these relationships is almost impossible. And the person who burnt his legal files when he arrived back in Jamaica was a step-parent to children who he met, who he started being the parent for when he met the youngest when he was six months, when she was six months, and then went to prison two years later. So then the Home Office was easily able to say, the mum the mum is fine without you, you were separated anyway by prison, and you're not a biological parent. And so even when we're trying to make a legal case, we try and gather evidence that he did pick her, the child's children up from nursery and all this stuff. One, the Home Office will disbelieve you and ask for more evidence, and no evidence is ever enough. But two, I guess we want to think about the limitations of imagining that care and what we all need to survive in this world can be limited to relations of blood or measured in years, um, or the genuine and subsistent part, relationships with genuine and subsisting partner, which is the legal term, should be akin to marriage and involve cohabitation and involve shared finances. All these things are kind of, they're kind of heteronormative compulsions within immigration law that also bind what kinds of legal arguments we can make. So that the idea that you would want to stay where your friends are is completely ridiculous to the Home Office. But why? Why should a young person not be able to say, the reason I don't want to leave this part of the UK is because all my friends are here. And that's completely impossible to make that argument in court. So I just kind of wanted to make that point that in all of these cases, what we're seeing, what we see is the complete 
illegibility of the kinds of ties that Kwaku describes, which are actually incredibly traumatic. Um, and that, especially with working class men who are, who are denied the right to work, often what they do is care work. And I met a lot of men whose mum, who the mums of the children do the earning, the breadwinning, and the men then get, then do a lot of care, but that care is invisible, ignored, and often denigrated because they're apparently irresponsible because they've got a criminal record or they're irresponsible because they don't care for children financially. So the point then is that we should be thinking critically about how we're compelled to make certain kinds of arguments and fall into the same sort of language that um, ties between loved ones only really count if they can be measured in years or blood. Um, Elisa, Elisa yeah, do, you mind, do you mind if I make a point about language? Um, just because Luke just mentioned language and, and, and how important it is. And we'll talk about it later when we talk about what things we can do to start to really combat this. But we always have to remember that the Home Office and these government policies have been designed with a purpose in mind. And they under, the designers, the drafters of these policies understand the impact of language and the use of language to preempt the arguments that you might make against the, the policy. So when we talk, we often tend to use the Home Office's language, right? Like trying to like argue someone out of the hole of being a foreign national offender is really hard because the entire conversation uses the words foreign national offender. So it becomes really, really, really difficult to remove the idea that this person might not be a bad person, right? Like it's really hard to fix it because all the language we use is their language. And so in every argument you make, whether it's in court, whether it's in the media, whether it's in parliament, you can't make a full argument. It's like, well, you know, who's going to stand up to defend this criminal, right? Like which politician, Labour or Conservative, is going to stand up and say, defend this criminal, right? This foreign national offender. And so we need to start thinking about how do you combat the language? How do you combat the meta structure of how this policy has been designed so that whichever way you go to try to argue something, they shoot you down? Because their goal is to diminish you, right? Their goal is to diminish a whole group of people. And so this language is designed to equate that diminishment with that group of people. Um, so when you're arguing, when we're in the media, we're talking about the effect of immigration, what we're doing is we're making the argument for them because we're using their language. And we literally need to like get to the crux of that because until we do, I mean, you, we can sit here and talk about like um, someone who was born in the UK or grew up in the UK from a young age should never be deported regardless of whether they've um, been convicted of a criminal offense as to we're blue in the face, but no one will listen until you show that like, a black kid who gets um, arrested for a criminal offense is more likely to get a 12 month sentence as a result of the policy than a white kid who gets done for a, a driving offense, the same offense. Because as soon as I give you the 12 month minimum threshold, you're liable to be stuck in this process. And the more egregious the story, the more inhumane the story, the more focus it gets in the press and the more it does the Home Office's job for them. Because the whole point of this process is to stratify the society so that the poor working class white people have someone below them who has brown or black skin. And that, that person, that person at the bottom, those brown and, bra brown and black people aren't worth as much because they are the minority in the group. So this language, the language is designed to diminish people. So when we talk um, around these issues, we now need to start thinking about what language should we use to undermine the evil effect of the Home Office language and the government policy. Thank you so much, Kwaku. Um, I can see that Zabeda would like to add something to that. I was going to move on to the next question, which I think will overlap. So you will probably be able to cover, cover both, both in that. Um, the next question that we were going to discuss was, how do you think systematic racism in the UK intersects with the issue of deportation and detention? And we'll go to um, Zabeda first, so you can address your previous point as well. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say, I. Um, it's been such a powerful, such a powerful conversation. Um, and I think Quaker, Quaker, you in particular have illustrated and demonstrated, if you like, 
all our theory about what's going on through your life. And um, thank you for sharing that. I think Kweku is absolutely right that moving, moving ahead, we have to start by challenging the government's language, home office language around this. I want to just demonstrate one of the points that Kweku made around foreign national offenders. Last year, in 2019, when um, the government tried to deport foreign, foreign national offenders on the Jamaican charter flight, Sajid Javid said that the reason they were being deported is because they had committed, quote, very serious crimes and they were foreign national offenders. But soon after, literally a few days after, when they got challenged about it, Sajid Javid admitted in Parliament that most of the deportees had committed minor crimes, like single drug offences, including driving offences. Now, what's really worrying about that Jamaican charter flight that happened last year is that 13 people on that flight had come to the UK as children, nine of whom came under the age of 10, 11 had indefinite leave to remain, indefinitely to remain. That means that's, that's, that's the equivalent of British citizenship almost. And one person even had a British passport. Now, the most important thing is this, which is what is the point of having a criminal justice system if, even if you have served your sentences, because you're black and ethnic minority, because you're foreign, foreign by the strict definition of foreign, it doesn't matter if you're more British than foreign, if you're foreign in any way and not, you don't have white British citizenship, if you like, what is the point of having a criminal justice system? Because if, if, you're, if, if that system isn't rehabilitating you, if that system isn't the end of the punishment of your crime, then what is? And if that's the case for the government, if that's the case that actually, you know, if you're black and ethnic minority, if you're foreign in any which way or form, that even after you've served your sentence, that you can still be deported, that you have not only a double punishment, but a triple punishment if you include detention, then be honest about it. Be honest about it from the outset and say, actually, you know what, the colour of your skin or even having any foreign heritage means that we have a two-tier citizenship system. And the criminal justice system actually isn't the end of, your, end of your crime. And actually, when we say serious crimes, we don't mean serious crimes. We mean minor crimes too. So that we really need to challenge that. I think the other thing we need to challenge, and something which Carmen um, and Kweku um, raised, I think, in, in, in different ways, is this is that the notion is that is that the bar for deportation has not only been lowered so now you can be deported even with minor crimes you can be deported even if you're born here but also there is there is no protection anymore there's absolutely no protection and i think we need to challenge that one of the things we saw in the windrush scandal is that a lot of people got deported or even put into including being put into detention, because they couldn't prove that high criteria, that prove that high criteria of citizenship, that high criteria of pain, of trauma, of separation that Carmen spoke about. And what we need to do is challenge that. It is not fair. If, if that can't be applied to all citizens equally, it's just not fair. So I think I just wanted to sort of come in in there in terms of, you know, really agreeing and supporting what Kweku was saying about starting to challenge the system. Um, sorry, two other things I wanted to add is um, we need to remove good character requirements. Good character requirements are highly racialized. There is no statutory definition of what is good character. And in fact, good character varies from um, acts of terrorism to instances of notoriety and includes non-conducive activities. I mean, what is that? What, what, what is non-conducive? My children on a, ba on a daily basis at the moment since lockdown have been committing non-conducive activities. What is that? 
but of course it gets applied in such a racialized way that suddenly before you know it you're being deported and we have to challenge that good character requirements has not only invaded the lives of black and ethnic minority citizens in this country but it's being applied to children over the age of 10 who all they need to do is register their citizenship but as soon as they get into any trouble with the criminal justice system over the age of 10 they are then considered to not be of good character so we need to scrap good character requirements. We need to scrap it in the first instance to children, which is highly, highly inappropriate. That, by the way, come under Labour too. I've got a few pet peeves, if you like, with, with the Labour government since 2000. But also remove it for adults, because it's not appropriate. It, it doesn't have a statutory definition. And I think finally, sorry, I'm taking up a long time. Finally, I want to say, we need to reinstate birthright citizenship. The biggest injustice that has been done for the last 30 years is the removal of birthright citizenship because the removal of birthright citizenship has been highly discriminatory. It has only infected, affected anyone with any foreign national links or black and ethnic minority populations and it needs to be removed, uh, it needs to be reinstated. If you're born here, if you've had spent most of your life here it's not just your close connection it's that you belong thank you thank you very much um i want to come to nadine to talk a bit about this um because it's very relevant to her book um talk about what exactly i feel like we've moved from the question was the was the question the one about um yeah, so looking at kind of how um, systematic racism within the UK intersects with deportation yeah. and uh, detention. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that the crucial thing to bear in mind is that law itself is, um, law is itself racial violence. Um, it's not separate to systematic violence. It, it's, it's, it is a system that systematizes racial violence, even if you think about the system of precedent, treating like cases alike, essentially once you get one injustice built into the system, you get repeated injustices built into the system. Um, it's precisely um, set up to continue to reproduce um, racialized subjects and their disproportionate vulnerability to the kinds of instances of racial violence that we've been hearing a lot about today. Um, and so I suppose when we're thinking about that, and, and, and obviously we're thinking about that as legal scholars and legal practitioners and people who use the law and use the language of the law, we have to be um, aware that um, the work that we do and the language that, you use, that we use is implicated in that system of racial violence just by invoking the law itself. And I think that, and, and it's, this really um, is important when it comes to immigration law because in relation to immigration law the, the law has two roles it is both the thing that prevents you from arriving in britain or from accessing basic means of life if you don't have a particular status but it's also the thing you then need to rely on if you're going to make the case for yourself that you do have a right um, to accessing um, resources etc um, and so there's always this bind that when you invoke the law or when you say, oh, you know, citizens should all be treated in the same way, we are citizens, we have a right to be seen as citizens, et cetera. When you invoke the law and those rights, what you're doing is you're buying into this notion that the British state, what I would describe as, a, as an ongoing colonial state, has in it this, this vested power to determine who has the right to access Britain, who has the right to access resources. So there's always a way in which you're reinforcing that very kind of origin of racial state violence when you um, invoke the law. And of course, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult because, you know, that's all we have to rely on when we're in court, etc. But I think it's just that when we're having these discussions, we need to be aware um, of some of the violence that um, is allowed to happen because we say, well, these people fall into this status and I've managed to make that case, you know, that lot fall outside, but it's not relevant right now. So that's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay if we're trying to build um, um, 
uh, movements that are based on anti-racism, migrant justice, racial justice. Um, and so I think, I, think, I think it's important to think about Britain um, as an ongoing colonial space. And maybe we can draw an analogy here that kind of can help us understand that, you know, if indigenous people in settler colonies like Australia and Canada um, have to go through this terribly burdensome um, system of kind of proving that they have a right to, to land, um, even though the very fact of the existence of the white settler colony demonstrates that its genocidal origins and its and its and its um, its its theft of land, you know, we can say that this problem of deportation, you know, let's not talk about it just as deportation, but just even people who are not here yet in being prevented from coming here are in a way deported, are in a way themselves also prevented from accessing what I would regard as being rightfully theirs, if we look at Britain as an ongoing colonial space, as having its wealth through colonialism and slavery, um, as, as, as having um, resources and infrastructure that are only there because of processes of dispossessive processes of colonialism and slavery. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to us to really think about the law as being that very edifice of, of, of systematic racism that we're talking about and therefore to be careful when we're invoking the law or when we're using the law um, and just be aware of what we're doing and I think and I think that kind of maybe pushes us towards thinking about those without status so irregularized presence or regularized migrants you know actually we can regard that um, category of people as being involved in a long history of anti-colonial struggle. We can regard irregularized migration as anti-colonial struggle. It sounds radical, but it is exactly what follows from shifting our understanding um, around what Britain is rather than a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state with the right to police its borders, but actually being a contested colonial space in which racialized people are consistently barred from accessing and when they are here are made subject to horrific um, risks and harm, including things like deportation. But actually they have an entitlement to be here um, an entitlement to access um, Britain and its resources. Thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time for this uh, panel and I do want to make sure that we have time to come to each of you on what we think we need to change. I'm really sorry if you have submitted questions. I can see we have lots of questions. So I'll circulate those and we'll see if we can do something to answer them. Um, to kind of, I guess, conclude our discussion, I think it would be really good to come to each of you on um, what you think needs to change and also I guess what we can do to make that happen and maybe Nadine do you want to continue as you were looking on that? No I'll let someone else go first please. I, I'll come okay. Yeah. Cool who's the brave person who's going to tell us how we're going to solve all this? Shall we go to I'm not getting any takers. It's a difficult question. <laughs> so yes, it is, Kwaku, it, thank you. Yeah, okay, you're right. It is a difficult question. Um, but, but I think to answer it requires two things. First is to kind of just sit in this racism, um, systemic racism issue, you know, 400 years of, since the slave trade began and colonialism afterwards, and then place immigration within that framework. So you just instead of immigration, like use a different word, right? So like, we're not like, when, you, when, you, when, when we talk about migrants, we're really using immigration as a cover for black and brown people or people from the global South, because ultimately all of the colonial, um, ex-colonial um, subjects of the UK are from the global South. So once you put that in place and, you, and then you start thinking about what is the purpose of the immigration policy, the purpose of the immigration policy, as I just mentioned, was that it's to stratify the society so that there's someone at the bottom who's been disenfranchised. So once you factor that and then you say, OK, so immigration policy is just a continuation of the racist uh, underpinning of the capitalist system and the immigration policies have flared up and become more draconian as a result of the increasing austerity in Western economies and the fact that the people at the bottom, working class white people, or actually brown and black skinned people, just below working class people, are really suffering because trickle down economics doesn't work. And so there's a direct relationship between 
capitalism and the violence that underpin it, underpins it, because it started with slavery, and that and the immigration processes that are in place at the moment are a continuation of that. So the first thing we have to do is acknowledge that. Once you've acknowledged that, then you have to say, well, okay, actually the real problem is that there's just so much inequity in this system. How do we attack that inequity at the economic level and draw the parallel and highlight the fact that the government is manipulating language to pretend that immigration is not racism, right? So we need to remake that um, that that link very powerfully and show that the government is being disingenuous. And there's lots of ways to do it. You could use, for example, Hansard. If you did a search in Hansard and you look at, you know, the words foreign national offender and look at how many times that it's happened in the and has been used in parliament in a debate, you find that it's it's been used about 840 times. Half of those times have happened since 2010. A quarter of all the times happened in the three months before the Brexit vote. Why? Because every time we talk about foreign national offenders, you get a headline about immigration in the newspapers, which obviously radicalizes society and allows you to control um, uh, and, and order the, and hierarchically order the society. Once we know that that's what's happening, we can start to attack it. You can attack the language, you can attack the sense of fairness about a system that is actually being very unfair to most people and the sense of unfairness that comes from being blamed, well, from knowing that someone is being blamed for something that's not their fault that's affecting you. And what the coronavirus pandemic is doing is it's giving people time to stop, reflect, and observe what's happening around them in the world. And because they've, not, because middle-class white people in the UK, especially, and in the US as well, have basically been sat under the control of the government whilst watching the elites abusing the very controls that they are suffering under, they've suddenly gone, hang on, if I'm being treated this way, which feels unfair, what about those people that are below me, that I've been given as the enemy? Um, and, 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 I, and I think once we, we stop equivocating with this stuff, foreign national offender, oh, you know, his was a serious crime. His was not a serious crime. Well, he should be deported because he's got no children. He should be deported he, because his sentence was extra long. All these things are very subjective and they're, they're, they're open to the manipulation of politics and, 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 and to the manipulation that leads to narrative control. Um, and I think that's where we need to attack it because basically it's being used to control societies and, but not to a positive end. And I think we need to stop playing in their sandbox and say the sandbox is actually full of toxic um, chemicals and we just shouldn't be there at all let's make a new sandbox and like whilst we are arguing on the minutiae of the law the government gets absolutely everything they want because they still get this social stratification they still get this manipulation and people feel like oh, okay well I'm not there's someone worse than me so I'm, I'm not going to complain against the system um, that's what we need to attack I think thank you very much uh, thank you. Um... Does anybody want to go next? Yeah, I'd like to just, just um, echo what, what's already been said, but um, just a couple of points. I mean, we certainly think the automatic deportation order system should be abolished and that people should be allowed um, to stay if they've been here a very long time or all born here. Um, and we need to clearly reconsider these ideas about what integration actually is and what, what, what Britishness actually is about. Um, but also, uh, we, we think the um, unduly harsh test really has no place yeah, in the system. It, it, it justifying cruelty uh, is it, it, just simply not, it, it's not acceptable. Um, I just want to flag up one other point. It, it links a bit to one of the earlier questions about systemic racism. It's just that the, um, the Lamy Review um, in 2017 um, was looking at the um, criminal justice system and, and um, how black and minority people are treated in that. Um, and that they're more likely to come into contact with the police and justice system over the prison population. I think we need to look at why that is. It's a broader issue, it's yes, the immigration, but also the criminal justice system, because clearly it has huge implications in terms of, of the deportation and, and the consequences of the individual and, and the families. Um, so it's, it's a, obviously a, a broader, it's beyond just immigration, the immigration law, but actually it's a the criminal justice system. And has also been, been talked about language and where, as well. It's obviously um, a, a lots of work to be done in lots of different areas. Thanks, Carmen. Um, so, Veda, did you want to go and talk about that? Um, 
I, first of all, I have to apologise. I'm so sorry. I, I've got to leave. Um, I've got a child waiting for me. Um, so, um, just to say, this has been a fantastic, a fantastic, and inspiring, heartbreaking, all of those things, um, session. Um, thank you, everybody, for that. I won't um, sort of talk much more about what needs to be done. Hopefully, I've said that in terms of scrapping good character requirements in terms of reinstating birthright citizenship. But um, also, I suppose, I want to say that this all ties in with how black and ethnic minority people are treated on a daily basis in the UK, which is that in general, black and ethnic minority people are over-policed and under-protected. And the way the state treats them in terms of deport detention and deportation is the same. The criteria is the same. The harsh application of criteria, it's all the same. So I guess the, the, my final parting words really is, is that we need to address that disparity. There is no point at all talking about racial equality, having commissions looking at racial inequality, as Boris Johnson has suggested recently, unless, to begin with, Black and ethnic minority people are safe and secure, that anyone with foreign connections are safe and secure. That is the fundamental basis of not only citizenship, but also of belonging, that you cannot even talk about equality until we have equality in citizenship. And so that's where I would stop. Thank you very much. We are running slightly out of time, so but I do want to make sure that we're coming to uh, Naveen and Luke. Um, so do bear with us for the last kind of five minutes or so of this discussion. Uh, Luke, did you want to um, say anything yeah, else? I'll have a go. Um, I suppose I want to say something about which exceeds specific campaigns for laws to change. And I think at the moment that's especially an especially lively thing to think about with the BLM protests and people reading and talking and sharing resources on prison abolition. And so Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, for example, um, kind of the godmother with Angela Davis of writing on prison abolition, has a new book coming out which is called The One Thing We Need to Change is Everything. So the easy answer to what we need to change is, is everything. And part of that involves radical political imagination. Um, and one of the things that is central to prison abolition is arguments against innocence. And I think Quaker made this point really well, which is, do we want to fall into the dead end of the toxic sandpit where the toxic sludge is of arguing about innocence, contribution and integration? And I know we have to do that in the short term for strategic gains. But these languages around innocence uh, really limit the kinds of things we can say. And so rather than that, um, thinking about the connections between anti-racist work on policing and on criminalization, which is speaking to Carmen's point, but expanding it somewhat to say that, for example, we know that racist policing around the gangs, around gangs means that people are being deported way short of 12 months. Under Operation Nexus, for example, which people can look into in their own time, people are being deported on suspicion, in the words of Francis Weber. People are being deported. I've met someone who had ILR, indefinite leave to remain, came to the UK when he was four, was deported at 20 and never served a custodial sentence, was deported as a persistent offender, which is a clause that allows people to be deported way short of 12 months. So that comes back to the first question in a way. But the, the, the point is that people are being deported for so little because we do not have the languages to challenge uh, to challenge criminality, innocence, all of those languages, which Quay, if you pointed to really well. The only other thing I briefly want to say is that I think we need to be um, kind of, and sorry, to go back to that, that point, one of the things that relates to that is that we can make the point, for example, that what is the point in prison uh, if it's not to rehabilitate, if people can't be given a second chance, but we might be better rather than arguing that, that point, that why do we have prisons if people can't be given a second chance is to actually think about what prisons have done in the last 30 years in this country the population has doubled sentences have lengthened we're spending 2.5 billion pounds building prisons under boris johnson to put 10,000 people in cages so rather than saying white british prisoners get this and the foreigners get it even worse we could also say putting anyone in a cage is an incredibly violent and unacceptable way to deal with harm in society and when we do that, we might start to make different arguments, which don't always rely on 
what, what a kind of imaginary liberal version of prison as rehabilitative, which it hasn't been in this country for a long time. And also that relates to a point which is, I think we should be agile enough in the context of leaving the European Union fully by the end of this year, to think not only in terms of black and minority ethnic, and so uh, a lot of people who have been detained and a lot of the foreign offenders who've been deported increasingly have been EU nationals, especially from Eastern Europe, but also black and brown Western and Northern Europeans. So we need to actually also think about what's changing and what's moving in the context of Brexit and in the context of the will to deport EU nationals and how therefore racial categories and racial hierarchies are also shifting slightly. Um, and so just to leave with one parting short anecdote that was, and it's a tragic one, but there was a boy who was detained in the same prison as one of the guys in my project at the same age in the West Midlands for the same offence, which was burglary. Both had been here since they were small children. And this guy, when he received a letter from the Home Office telling him that he was going to be deported to Slovakia, killed himself in prison. And I think one of the things that thinking about immigration control, about deportation and detention does, is allow us to expand outside of uh, our small categories, whether that's, let's say, I care about Jamaicans or I care about Ghanaians or whatever it might be, or I, or I only care about Eastern Europeans or I care about black minority ethnic, to think about the connections as well between people who are locked in cages, people who are banished, um, which are disproportionately black and brown people who are former colonial subjects, but not only. And so how do we build links with the various people uh, living through the same system, which I'm sure um, most people who've been detained know about and live, live through themselves. Thank you, Luke. Um, Nadine, just coming to you. I mean, I'd really like to leave it on, on what Luke said. Um, I would only add, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that he said. Um, I think it's about taking the, the kind of demands that we're hearing now of, around abolition and defunding seriously and kind of understanding them in relation to a whole host of um, instances of um, state violence, um, which will help us to, to kind of um, uh, deal not just with deportation, but all, all kinds of harms that people are exposed to. Um, and I think part of that is um, recognizing that, you know, not getting caught up in kind of thinking, okay, all of these things are so new, and if we just change this little bit of law, then, 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 then we're gonna solve this problem. Because really, you know, as 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 I was hearing um, Quaker speak and, and and also Carmen about some examples of you know people have gone through and Luke, I, I you know I was thinking about all the sort all sorts of things that colonial authorities have done to destroy racialized families, you know, for all time, separating family members, selling slave families off separately, um, stealing children, um, imprisoning them, in, and schooling them in you know ways that destroy their cultures and heritages and um, refusing family reunification you know all of these instances that, that we see today are, are really uh, in instances of racial state violence that are really in a long line um of, of of instances of colonial violence and i think that once we start to to understand that and to make our demands more on the level of reparative um, that of course we'll see our demands being more radical and us connecting dots that the law prevents us from doing because it's precisely not about connecting dots but about separating the individual from the entire social structure um, then we're going to get much closer um, towards actually seeing some of the things that we want to see um, to, to see happen so yeah I'll just I'll leave it at that thank you thank you so much um, that is all that we have time for today. I'm, again, I'm so sorry if you ask questions and we didn't get to answer them. We will try and do something with those questions and get you some kind of answer. Um, thank you also for bearing with us. We did have a couple of technical hiccups, um, but I'm hoping we managed to resolve those fairly quickly for you all. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about this topic, please do keep in touch with BID and make sure that you're following all our incredible panellists on Twitter. Uh, they tweet about this topic very regularly um, and I think you find that very insightful. Um, also to mention that Nadine and Luke both have books published with Manchester University Press and for the next few days you can order Nadine's and pre-order Luke's for half price with the discount Summer 50, that's capital letters, Summer 50. Um, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to remind you that BID is a very small independent charity and there is a suggested donation of five pounds for today's event. So if you are able to support us, please head over to our website, www.biduk.org to make a donation and we will spend every penny 
of that on providing free legal advice to people facing detention and deportation. So I'd like to finally say thank you so much for coming today. This webinar will also be available on demand, so do share it with anyone that you think might be interested. Uh, we hope that you have a lovely uh, evening and we do hope to continue this conversation. So do join with us in uh, trying to put all of this into action that we've just been talking about. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.